Hi, you beautiful New Zealanders. Well, tonight I'm going to show you a fantastic video. I'm going to start this video by showing you part of an interview between Tama Potaka, who is the current Minister of Maori Development and a key person inside the National Party. I want you to notice that Tama Potaka refuses to say whether Maori ceded sovereignty or not. What's the reason for this? Well, if he says Maori ceded sovereignty, he will have the wrath of Maori come down on him. And he doesn't want that. On the other hand, if he says Maori did not cede sovereignty, then he'll be at odds with the Prime Minister, Chris Luxon, who's just said that Maori ceded sovereignty. And that's an impossible situation. But what I really want you to notice here is that he says Maori ceded sovereignty and Parliament is supreme. But on the other hand, he says that the national government believes in Tino Rangatiratanga, which is essentially a way of Maori saying, quote, we did not cede sovereignty. So what's he doing? Tama Potaka is hunting with the hounds and running with the hares. He's living in a world full of contradictions and impossible paradoxes. If Maori ceded sovereignty, they can't possibly have their own sovereignty over New Zealand as well as the duly elected government, surely. Yet this is Tama Potaka's world, and this is Chris Luxon's world. What Luxon and Potaka are trying to do is please everyone. You know what? That counts them both out as true leaders. Watch this. People should have the ability to do what they want with more dollars in their pocket, right? But the things that Māori talk about are things like the titi. So if, if you don't want, I kind of want to raise this, because yeah? I'm really keen to see what you think. Because it has been said, and your Prime Minister has said, that Māori ceded sovereignty. When did Māori do that? Well, first of all, I just want to address the first thing. We came in on the basis of our election promises around getting the economy back on track, restoring law and order, and delivering public services better. There are a number of coalition agreements that were reached as well on a number of things, but certainly, in my view, it's absolutely fundamental for us to get the economy sorted, uh, law and order, back on track, health, education, housing. There are a range of other matters which you've raised, uh, which I think we've reached a lot of coalition agreements around and our coalition sure. is progressing some of those things. Yeah, so well, that's, I, I get that's that. the first thing. But to be fair, this is an issue that has been talked about a lot. It is still being talked about. The Prime Minister has said that Māori said sovereignty. I'm just trying to talk to you. Yes. When did Māori cede sovereignty? I think what um, um, my recollection of the Prime Minister uh, uh, saying over the last few weeks is that the Crown is sovereign. Therefore, Māori said of sovereignty. Uh, there's been a session of sovereignty. When? That's what the, that's what the uh, Prime Minister has said. Yeah. When, when did Māori and I, and I, support the, I support the Prime Minister. OK, so you tell me when yeah. Māori said Well, what I'm going to say is this, is that it's a debate and a discussion and a quarter that's been going on for several decades. Right here and now... I'm just asking you. Yeah, I know you're just asking me, but right here and now, uh, I'm not engaging in the debate apart from to support the Prime Minister that the Crown is sovereign. But what I'm engaging on are, are the, the needs... Problem. This is the problem. You've got... You've got uh, a leader of a coalition government partner mm. in the ACT Party with a Treaty Principles Bill mm. who talks about things like setting the record straight. And I'm just trying to get you to set the record straight with us. Because yeah. you believe Māori ceded sovereignty. I support the view of the Prime Minister, which is the Crown is sovereign. But what I also support, and you know this uh, by just looking around uh, this room, Matangi Reya, is that there is an absolute protection and support for Tino Rangatiratanga, which preserved uh, 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 well before the treaty was signed and well before the Whakaputanga was signed. And that notion of Tino Rangatiratanga will be upheld. <laughs> I'm just asking a simple question. When did Māori cede sovereignty? And well, how did they do that? Well, there's been a number of different views no, just, on that. You and, just tell me. Yeah, you just tell me. a number of different views There are Māori who want to know from you yes. when and how yes. Māori ceded sovereignty. Yes. And there's a number of different views on that. And I'm not going to entertain that in a very well, tight why discussion. Why what your view? I'm just asking yeah, your view. But, but I've, I've said uh, to you, you others, who have, others who have asked me that question, I've said, what kind of discussion do you want to have? Do you okay. want to have a the discussion? The discussion is asking your question of when and how. But do you want to have a discussion? Discussion about radical, absolute, titular, no, no, no. de jure, de facto sovereignty. What are you actually talking about? Because I just asked you. There's, there's a number. Of, there's a number of discussions caught up in that. No, what no, I'm no, really, no. what I'm really focused on, are the needs of Māori. Mm. One of which is to have better housing. And that's why I've gone we'll, all we'll out making, that. making sure we'll that a that. whole range of people, including all hundreds of Māori kids, are brought out of emergency housing. That's the here and now that I have to deal with. Now, the discussions about sovereignty are very important discussions. Yeah. They're absolutely critical. Discussions discussions, mm -hmm. but my responsibility in this coalition government is to undertake and deliver on the mighty development, housing here, and other responsibilities that I have. Now, yes. And they're going, here he goes again. 
Yes. This is what they're saying. Yes. You're not answering the question. Well, they're it's asking. A pretty simple and, question. And, 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 I know you're yeah. saying you don't want to entertain it. No. But the simple thing is, you believe it, you agree with it. As Māori, yes. as someone who is in this government, you are representing Māori in this government. Yes. I'm just asking the question, yeah. when and how? Well, that's 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 not a short conversation. That's quite an extended conversation. No, and, I don't, it, and, it I don't, and I don't... And I don't think... And I don't think... Standing right there, right? Yes, right yes, there. yes. To, to yes. Yeah. Right? Article 1 says kāwanatanga, right? Was that the session of sovereignty in your opinion? Tuatahi yes, says kawanatanga. Yeah. Article was, 1 says something else, yeah, as you no, know. True. And, and, and we are dealing with a bilingual, bicultural kawanata tapu. Yeah, and I'm talking about the tiriti, he te katau, the yeah, tuatahi, yeah. kawanatanga. Was that the session of sovereignty? Because that is definitely look, not look, to tuatua. Look, it's a very long conversation about something that something about something that we cannot answer with comprehensively. Okay. okay, so was it in te tuatahi? Was that where sovereignty was said? Sovereignty, as a word, is not in Te Tuatahi, no. but it is in Article 1. No, no, but in Te Tuatahi it says Te Kamanatanga. So that's, that's, right, that, that's what it says. Yeah, it's that's that's of sovereignty. Well, that's a, that's a long conversation we can't have. Wow, wasn't that interesting, seeing somebody trying to fudge their answers and not admit that Maori did not cede sovereignty, but at the same time saying Maori did cede sovereignty. Trying to please everybody, what a mess. Okay, we're in our series called The Treaty for Dummies, and we're still in Article 1 of the treaty. This is Part 7, so if you haven't seen the other parts, Parts 1 to 6, then I really ask you to go and watch those, because uh, you're going to get uh, really good at the treaty. You're going to understand the treaty, then when you talk about it with people, you're going to be somebody who can have some confidence to speak about it with authority. So, did Maori cede sovereignty or not? This is the critical question. In the Article 1, Parts 1 to 6 videos, we discovered that there are 10 reasons that Maori ceded sovereignty, or 10 proofs. In the first few videos, I've discussed what it would mean for New Zealand if Maori did not cede sovereignty. That's a good video. What it would mean for New Zealand if Maori did cede sovereignty. So, we need to know the difference about, you know, those two things. And I introduced the term the reversalist. What's that? A reversalist is someone who wants to reverse the decision made by the chiefs in 1840 to cede sovereignty to the British. And there's plenty of those around. Maori activists are reversalists. They want to go back on what the chiefs signed off on in 1840. These reversalists today say Maori did not cede sovereignty in 1840. They never produce proof or evidence to verify their claims. They don't. They just have opinion and they use speculation. All right. So then I said there were 10 proofs that Maori ceded sovereignty. And here they are. The first proof is that the existence of the treaty. Now, I'm not going to go through and explain what each, each one of these is. You'll have to watch the previous six videos to find out what they what I mean by this. Number two, the speeches of the chiefs. Number three, the Koe Marama Conference in 1860. Number four, the documented evidence from records inside the British Parliament. Number five, the headstone of Tamati Wakanene. Number six, the opinion of Sir Aparananata, New Zealand's greatest Maori. And then the eyewitness accounts of settlers who lived among Maori. So tonight, in this video, I'm going to take you through proofs 8, 9, and 10. So let's crack right into that. So what's the eighth proof that Maori ceded sovereignty? Well, there's a plaque at the Waitangi grounds at Waitangi which says this. On this spot, on the 6th of February 1840, was signed the Treaty of Waitangi, under which New Zealand became part of the British Empire. Man. What this plaque is saying, that the Treaty of Waitangi was the instrument used by the British to achieve sovereignty over New Zealand. Notice there is no mention on the plaque of Maori retaining their own sovereignty. Why? Because if Maori retained their own sovereignty, then it was impossible for New Zealand to have become part of the British Empire. The two concepts are mutually exclusive. In 1840, Britain had 50 colonies on the go. In no other colony was there a dual sovereignty arrangement. Such a thought would have been absolutely laughable to the British. It's unthinkable. And yet today, we're entertaining it. Luxon is entertaining it. Potak is entertaining it. You just saw that interview. This is crazy. So, for proofs 9 and 10, I need to give you a little bit of background. On the 15th of June, 1839, Britain declared, on paper at least, that New Zealand was part of New South Wales. New South Wales is just another name for what we call Australia today. This was done in anticipation of Maori ceding sovereignty in 1840. Then we go through to July the 30th, so that's sort of like, you know, a month later. Hobson was chosen by the British Parliament to be the man to go to New Zealand to work with the chiefs for the cession of sovereignty. The next date, he left left England with his wife and children on the 20th of August. So we've got June, July, August. It's all happening in England. En route, he was to call in at Sydney meeting with the Governor of New South Wales. Like I say, that was today's Australia. And his name was George Gibbs. Hobson arrived in Sydney on the 23rd of December, 1839. That's just before Christmas. The next important date is January the 14th. This is when Gibbs installed Hobson as the Governor of New Zealand. So he probably bowed the knee and had a sword on both shoulders. And he was officially 
officially made the Governor of New Zealand. Hobson set sail for New Zealand on the 19th of January 1840, arriving on Paihia 10 days later, that's Wednesday the 29th of January. So it was a 10 day trip on a, on a ship to go from Sydney to Paihia. Now, there are 31 days in January. The treaty was signed at Waitangi on the 6th of February, so Hobson and his team only had 9 days to write the treaty. That's not very long. On the 6th of February, as you know, 1840, 52 chiefs signed the Treaty of Waitangi. Between February the 6th, 1840 at Waitangi and September 1840, ships were sailing around gathering the signatures of the other chiefs. So just let you know, there were nine copies of the treaty, seven were made of dogskin, and two were written on paper, just in case you didn't know that. On the 21st of May, 1840, Hobson declared that Britain had sovereignty over the North Island, and on June the 15th, the South Island and Stewart Island. The South Island and Stewart Island were claimed on the grounds of the Doctrine of Discovery. Well, what's that? What's the Doctrine of Discovery? This doctrine goes right back to Captain Cook's proclamation at Mercury Bay on the 15th of November, 1769. Quote, At Mercury Bay, Cook simply reported that his party had cut into a tree the ship's name, that was the Endeavour, and the date of its landing, and they displayed the English flag, and officially, actually, became a British colony way back then, except they didn't do anything about it, which was a problem. They should have moved in straight away, and it would have been fine, but they didn't. So that was 1769. The next important date is June the 16th, 1840. The Legislative Council of New South Wales passed an act extending the colony's laws to New Zealand, as well as establishing courts and custom duties. So what happened was New South Wales, which was sort of the mothership for New Zealand, overseeing all the colonisation efforts of Hobson and the rest of the um, British party here, they were implementing laws uh, into New Zealand and uh, giving giving it greater and greater autonomy. So five months went by. During those five months, the signatures of the chiefs were being gathered. So my question was, has, had Hobson jumped the gun by declaring sovereignty over New Zealand before all the signatures of the chiefs had been gathered? No. He made the proclamation in anticipation of achieving sovereignty. That's the key word. He was anticipating all the chiefs signing, and that's why he went ahead and declared sovereignty on May the 21st and June 15. On the 16th of November, 1840, New Zealand Zealand officially became a British colony. Signed by the Queen, the Charter of November 16 vested the power of the British government in a governor, making New Zealand a crown colony separated from New South Wales. Now that is hugely significant. Would the British have done all this if they hadn't, if Maori hadn't ceded sovereignty? Absolutely no way. Then 11 years passed by, the New Zealand First Constitution Act was passed by the British Parliament in 1852, setting out how the country would be governed. Now my question is this. Maori activists today say, quote, Maori did not cede sovereignty. The British say, quote, with 100% certainty, Maori ceded sovereignty. They are absolutely diametrically opposed, the activists and the British Crown. Well, what are we going to do about this? The onus is on both parties to prove their case with facts and reliable evidence. To date, not one proof has been provided by Maori activists to prove their point that they did not cede sovereignty. Like I said, all they come forth with is speculation, stories, anecdotes, and opinions. All we ever hear today is the Maori perspective on the issue of sovereignty. This is akin to a court case with only one side putting up their case. This is what it's like. What about the British case? What about their point of view? What about their opinion? I can tell you from a British perspective, Maori ceded sovereignty. By spending a small fortune colonising New Zealand and all the stress and worry that went with that, Hobson died of stress and Governor Fitzroy committed suicide. Were the British delusional, just imagining that they had sovereignty but really they hadn't? No, that's impossible. Why? Well, there was a lot of British here who were involved in the treaty, not just Hobson's staff but the representatives of other nations like James Clendon, the US ambassador, and many, many missionaries, people of great integrity and intelligence. This large group of people were constantly consulting with each other. They they all agreed that Maori ceded sovereignty. Were all these British people living in a fantasy world, thinking that they had achieved sovereignty when in reality they hadn't? No, that's impossible. You know what I think? If only Hobson, Lord Normanby, Henry Williams, and the missionaries, James Clendon, the US ambassador, James Busby, the British resident, and the rest of the British team, if only they would rise from the dead and hold a meeting in our parliament tomorrow to tell us their side of the story. Wouldn't that be great? Thankfully, they don't have to. Why? Because they have left us full full and comprehensive notes and records of what happened, and they all concur. What do they all say? Maori ceded 
sovereignty. Okay, let's wrap this up. There are 10 proofs that Maori ceded sovereignty. The first is the existence of the treaty. The second is the speeches of the chiefs. The third is the Koemerima Conference 1860. The fourth is the documented evidence from records inside the British Parliament. Number five is the headstone of Tamati Wakanane. Number six is the opinion of Sarapurananada, New Zealand's greatest Maori. Number seven, the eyewitness accounts of settlers who lived among Maori. Number eight, the plaque at the treaty grounds in Waitangi. Number nine, the November the 16th, 1840 letters patent. And the last one is the 1852 constitution. Now, any one of those um, would be proof enough that Maori ceded sovereignty, but in, in combination, they it becomes incontrovertible. That's a good word to look up. That's how the British described the cession of sovereignty or getting sovereignty or achieving sovereignty in New Zealand. They said by, by the end of 1840, it was incontrovertible. It's a fantastic word. All right, please like this video. Please share it. Please comment. It really helps us. Don't forget to get the cards out. Here they are. And if you want to get some cards to help us, email this address, cards at stopcogovernance.care, where you can get some and keep getting those out. Thank you for all those who are helping financially. You're absolutely fantastic. Thank you for getting the cards out, you legends. See you next time.